Alright, church. Whose child are you? The child of the king. Amen. Yeah. There's something in the middle of my screen on the computer. You think it's okay? We just want you to know that children are precious in the sight of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And uh, all God's children are all y'all. <laughs> if you're one of God's children, raise your right hand and say amen. amen. If you need to uh, stand up and be awake, but it looks like everybody's awake today. In this scripture, it says uh, a little different. It says, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one who does not love his brother. So it's like obvious. Turn in your Bibles to Acts the 13th chapter. I know you're going to want to follow along here. You have different versions. This one is actually the um, New Living Translation. In Acts the 13th chapter, we find out about Paul and Barnabas. Paul, also called Saul, they were commissioned in verse 13, Acts 13, 13. It says, among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon called the black man. In the other uh, versions it says Niger, N-I-G-E-R, which is Latin basically for black. So isn't it a wonderful note? God had a diverse uh, community even in uh, the places where the Bible was first preached. Let's not forget that. And Lucius looked from Cyrene. And then May Mayan, and look at where he lived. He was the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas. Look at these folks, all these different folks that were uh, teachers, prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria. And last but not least, Saul. One day as these men were worshiping the uh, Lord, this is still now back up to uh, verse 2. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Well, verse 4 says, this is Paul's first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, verse 4. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. And there in the town of Salamis, they were, went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. Well, John Mark went with them as their assistant. And verse 6 says, afterwards they traveled from town to town across the entire island until they finally reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish, what? Sorcerer. A false prophet named Bar Jesus. That would have been Jewish. A Hebrew was Bar, meaning son of, and then Jesus would have been Greek, which meant um, like Joshua. Well, he had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man, and the governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. <laughs> But Elymas, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, in fear, interfered and urged the governor, oh, pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye, and then he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. And then instantly mist and darkness came over the man's eyes. And he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. And when the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. So here's a picture of this uh, sorcerer who's 
groping about in the trying to find his way because now he can't see. Boy, that would have been pretty powerful, wasn't it? Yeah. How many think that he kind of deserved what he got there for a while? Yeah, absolutely. It said for some time. So we have the hope that when he opened his eyes again and God opened his eyes again, he would actually have a different, uh, he'd have a change of mind. Amen? He'd see differently. He would see differently. Thank you, Brother Ray. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Not of God. And Paul, Saul, actually called him, you child of the devil. So the question is, whose child are you? Whose child am I? In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, in the, in the version, of, which is a paraphrased version, the message, it says uh, in verse in verse 19, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, here's what it says in the message. Meanwhile, God's firm foundation is as firm as ever. These sentences engraved on the stones. God knows who belongs to him. Steer clear of evil, all you, all you who name God as God. So we don't want to take his name in vain, do we? If we're his kids and we call ourselves his kids, a child of God, then we don't want to take it in vain and we will steer clear of evil. And guess what? God knows who belongs to him. In the uh, following verses after that, it says, In a well-furnished kitchen there are not only crystal goblets and silver platters, but waste cans and compost buckets, some containers used to serve fine meals and others to take out the garbage. Become the kind of container God can use to present any and every kind of gift to his guests for their blessing. Who are his guests? Those are all the people we're trying to share Jesus with, right? And we want to be one of his fine vessels. And if you read that in the other version, it talks about stone, wooden stone, and vessels of silver and gold. We want to be the vessels that, that are beautiful, that God has shaped. We want to be that kind of vessel. I learned the verse in uh, 2 Timothy 2.19 out of the King James Version, and I like it. I actually used to sing a song to this. Uh, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ Depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. So if we're calling ourselves his kids, we need to depart from iniquity. Because the foundation stands sure. God knows who's his and who's playing games, playing house, playing, playing with the word of God. We're going to go to chapter 19 of, of, of Acts. You're not there far away. You were in 13. Turn on over to chapter 19 in the, in the book of Acts. Here's another um, historical account of something that God gave to Paul as he had given his life of running around, trying to round up the Christians, arrest them, and put them in jail. He changed. God made him blind for a little while, didn't he? And when he got his sight back, he totally understood that God was God. And Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. So in chapter 19 of the book of Acts, in verse 11, it says, God gave Paul the power to form, perform unusual miracles. Unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases, and evil spirits were expelled. Wow. Wouldn't that be something? So he lived in the presence of God, and God gave this unusual miracle that, that he couldn't give to all the people that needed all the help from God that, that they needed. And so even some kind of little handkerchief or apron, if it had touched his skin, God said, because of your faith in me, I'll use this little piece of cloth and the two to perform the miracle. And But it was an unusual miracle, wasn't it? So then in um, chapter seven, 27 of the Acts of the Apostles, this is important for me to read. 
The Apostle Paul, in his labors at Ephesus, was given special tokens. Now this is in the Acts of the Apostles, a book written by Ellen White. You won't find this in chapter 27 of the book of Acts. This is a special book that I got some information from, so you might just want to look at the screen and read along with me, because that's where the words are going to be found. The Apostle Paul, in his labors at Ephesus, was given special tokens of divine favor. The power of God accompanied his efforts, and many were healed of physical maladies. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. And the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. The man these manifestations of supernatural power were far more potent than had ever before been witnessed in Ephesus, and were of such a character that they could not be imitated by the skill of the juggler or the enchantments. When it says the skill of the juggler, you know there are certain magicians, we call it sleight of hand. So you think about that. Those magicians were, they, here she calls them the skill of the juggler or the, or the enchantments of the sorcerer. Now think about that. One is sleight of hand and one is involving some kind of supernatural evil spirit that would come. As these miracles were wrought in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the people had opportunity to see that the God of heaven was more powerful than the magicians who were worshipers of the goddess Diana. Thus the Lord exalted his servant, Saul, Paul, even before the idolaters themselves, immeasurably above the most powerful and favored of the magicians. Well, verse 13 of Acts chapter 19, where you have your Bibles open, says this. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. You know, nowadays, at least when I was growing up, people did not think that there were evil spirits. I was like, you know. In fact, there's two dangerous things that can happen to you when you are uh, living the Christian life. And it is a warfare. It's a walk. It's a warfare. One of the things is you can, like my parents, who wanted to set me free from all kinds of uh, superstition, Ah, the devil, he was not really a devil, you know. In fact, my aunt, my great aunt, she had a black uh, collar, uh, cocker spaniel. And this black cocker spaniel had to come to live at our house after Aunt Ruth couldn't take care of it anymore, I guess. And would you believe that um, she named her black cocker, cocker spaniel Satan? <laughs> no respect, no understanding of the truth about these kinds of things. She named that Cocker Spaniel Satan. Now I'm going to tell you a true story. The uh, black Cocker Spaniel comes to live at the Mori household. My mother, raised Catholic, loves Jesus. And would you believe, as she um, is taking care of this dog, nobody changes the name. Nobody has the biblical understanding that there could be a true Satan. It was just like, you know, it's just a name, it doesn't have any power, it doesn't have any meaning. And at the Methodist Church, they had a new pastor. And the new pastor's name was Reverend Baumgartner. I remember him because he was my pastor also. So the next thing that happened was he made visits door to door to the new people at the, at the, uh, at the houses of the members of the new church where he was coming to live or to preach. So he comes to the door at my mother's house, and you can guess what happens. The dog, uh, she opens the door a little bit to keep, to say hi to this person who she doesn't know, she hasn't met yet. And as she opens the door, she stops her foot and says, back Satan, hello, can I help you? <laughs> There's two dangers about being a, a, a Christian in this Christian walk. True story. My mother was so embarrassed when she found out. Yes, hello. Um, my name's Reverend Baumgartner at the United Methodist Altar State Church. She wished she could have melted in a puddle, right? However, that's one problem. To not think that there's any power from the enemy. And then the other problem is to concentrate on it too much. And to think that there's an evil spirit behind every bush 
and in every person, and that has even given risen to some ministries where people have these exorc exorcism ministries. They think that you got a bad temper. Let me call out the the, the uh, evil spirit of bad temper. You are in adultery. Let me call out the spirit of adultery. And what can actually happen is, uh, and I'm not telling you something that of which I know not I speak, but there were ministers, traveling ministers who were even in the Adventist church who would uh, perform this kinds of what they thought was exorcism. The people who didn't have any bad spirits in them would sit there, they'd lay hands on them, and they'd try to call out the evil spirits, and guess what? Satan was more than willing to send an evil spirit so they could call it out. And so they would just uh, sit there and their lives can be ruined because now they walk away and they think they've got an evil spirit when they don't have an evil spirit. They've just been used like a medium for um, Satan and for Satan's pleasure. People need to know that there are evil spirits, that there is a bad devil and there is a good God, and that we don't need to f focus on evil spirits all the time, amen? amen? Well, these are hard things to say because when you think about it, there's going to be, um, there's going to be times when these kind of teachings, the enemy is going to even try to keep you from hearing it. And uh, one person I was, Anyway, walked out. <laughs> Somebody who needs this teaching can listen to it later, I guess. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. And they tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, or Siva, a leading priest, were doing this. Verse 14 of chapter 19 in the book of Acts. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? And then the man with the evil, the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. Verse 17. The devil can do stuff. We've been studying the book of Revelation that he'll cause fire to come down from out of heaven and he'll perform signs and wonders. And uh, if it were possible, he'd even fool the elect. So this guy, who they think they're going to help, turns on them and they go out of the house naked and battered. That was some incident in that room. <laughs> somebody was thrown against the wall, somebody was scratched, somebody was in a lot of pain, and there were seven of them, and they all fled out of the room, because why? Well, what happened afterwards was a solemn fear ascended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored, and many who became believers confessed their sinful practices, and verse 19, a number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought the, their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. Now check this out. The value of the books, this was in Ephesus, was several million dollars. Now the Bible in the most translations of the Greek, it says 50,000 pieces of silver, each of which was the equivalent of a day's wage. <laughs> a day's wage. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. So here's a little image of them bringing their incantation books and having them burn right there, right there in public. Set a fire, set these, these very expensive books on fire. Back to the Acts of the Apostles by Ellen White in chapter 27, it says, Ephesus was a popular center for the worship of Diana, and the fame of the magnificent temple of Diana of the Ephesians extended throughout all Asia and the world. Its surpassing splendor, this temple, made, the, made, uh, made it the pride not only of the city, but the nation of Greece. The idol within the temple was declared by tradition to have fallen from the sky. Upon it were inscribed symbolic characters which were believed to possess great power. So, books had been written by the Ephesians to explain the meaning and use of these symbols, and among those who gave 
close study to the costly books were many magicians who yielded a powerful influence over the minds of the superstitious wor worshippers of the image within the temple. So that's how it worked. But listen to this part from Ellen White's teaching. But the one to whom all the spirits of evil are subject, who's that? The one, the one capital O-N-E, to whom all the spirits of evil are subject, would be the Lord God, right? He created those angels and they're fallen, but God is the one that all those evil angels have to be subject to, and who had given his servants authority over them, was about to bring still greater shame and defeat upon those who despised and profaned God's holy name. Sorcery had been prohibited by the Mosaic Law on pain of death, yet from time to time it had been severely or secretly practiced by apostate Jews. And even to this day, there is something that is attributed to the Jewish religion that has to do with magic. At the time of Paul's visit to Ephesus, there were in the city certain of the vagabond Jews' ex exorcists. She's going to go back and talk about what we just read about in Acts 19 who seeing the wonders wrought by him, by Paul, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. So thus, unmistakable, and, and then as you remember, the, they, were, they were run out of the room by the, by the evil spirit and they, they, it didn't work for them, right? That's the point, so I'm not gonna read that again, but this is what she says about that. The fact that they were run out of the, out of the, the room with this man and, and, and it did not succeed, thus unmistakable proof was given of the sacredness of the name of Christ and the peril which they incurred who should invoke it, the name, without faith in the divinity of the Savior's mission. So they did it wrong. They did it wrong. They really didn't believe in the Savior. They thought they used it like a magic word. They thought, if we say this word, then it's got to happen, because that's what happens when Paul does it, so when we say it, it's got to happen. And God's name is not a magic word. It, when, his, um, his, when we take upon the name of Christ in baptism, you know, he said, I have called you by name, you are mine. When we're his, then his name is on us, and what we do has a big, has a big uh, um, consequence. God cares about it. It's part of the commandments not to take the name of the Lord in vain. So because they got, they got turned upside down and their little project didn't work, everybody went, whoa, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So God is letting this happen right there in Ephesus. Facts which had previously been concealed were now brought to light. In accepting Christianity, some of the believers had not fully renounced their superstitions. To some extent, they still continued the practice of magic. And now, confirmed of their error, many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Even to some of the sorcerers themselves, the good work extended, and many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. This is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27. By burning their books on magic, and I want you to get this, the Ephesian converts showed that the things in which they had once delighted, they now abhorred, they now hated. And it was by and through the magic that they had especially offended God and imperiled their souls. And it was against magic that they showed such indignation. Thus they gave evidence of true conversion. See, why would God be upset? He's upset because they're talking with the enemy and they're imperiling their souls are in danger. So here it is again, they burned those books. The reality, the treatises of divination contain rules and forms of communication with evil spirits. They were the regulations of the worship of Satan, directions for soliciting his help and obtaining information from him. By retaining these books, the disciples would have exposed themselves to temptation. By selling them, they would have placed temptation in the way of others. 
And they had renounced the kingdom of darkness, and to destroy the power, its power, they did not hesitate at any sacrifice. And thus, truth triumphed over men's prejudices and their love of money. So, you know, in my family when we grew up, there was no such thing as ghosts. Of course, ghosts are not are not a thing, are they? They are, uh, if they're anything, they are the spirits of the evil angels that impersonate loved ones. And we didn't think Satan was a very important thing to even mention. He ended up being the name of a dog. And so, you know, there's this side, eh, nothing to that. And then there's this side, it's real. And we need to stay away from it. But how cool that these people figured out Man, we don't we, we want nothing to do with this anymore. We've just had our eyes open. We we know that this is not God's way, and there is a Lord Jesus, and there is a heaven to gain, and there is a hell to shun. And their their uh, their love of money was not as great as their love for this wonderful truth that they embraced. And I bet you they were delivered from these thought, evil thoughts. Here it says, by this manifestation of the power of Christ, a mighty victory for Christianity was gained in the very stronghold of superstition. The influence of what had taken place was more widespread than even Paul realized, and from Ephesus the news was widely circulated, and a strong impetus was given to the cause of Christ. People heard that these folks who had been powerful in the city of Ephesus, that had done these magic tricks, that had influenced people, that had cast spells and people had had bad things happen to them, good things happen at the end. Well, I don't know what that's from, but somebody's going to fix it for me. Oh, I went back too far. I lost it. Lost all of my next parts of reading. And that's the way it goes. Maybe it's just, it's, it's up here, but it's not there. Okay, I can do that. It is fondly supposed that heathen superstition. Grab the mic. Okay. My mic man has got me covered. It is fondly supposed that heathen superstitions have. Your mic's not on. Mic's on. Oh, it's not. I don't know. It's free. It's fondly supposed that heathen superstitions have disappeared before the civilization of the 20th century. But the word of God and the stern testimony of facts declare that sorcery is practiced in this age as verily as in the days of the old time magicians. The ancient system of magic is in reality the same as what is now known as modern spiritualism. Right. Satan is finding access to thousands of minds by presenting himself under the guise of departed friends. The scriptures declare that the dead know not anything, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5. Amen. Their thoughts, their love, their hatred have perished. The dead do not hold communion with the living, but true to his early cunning, Satan employs this device in order to gain control of minds. Through spiritualism, many of the sick, the bereaved, the curious are communicating with evil spirits, and all who venture to do this are on dangerous ground. The word of truth declares how God regards them. And that was because even when that happens, some really bad stuff happens. Some people died as a result. The magicians of heathen times have their counterpart in the spiritualistic mediums, the clairvoyants and the fortune tellers of today. The mystic voices that spoke at Endor, you've heard of the witch of Endor? Uh, bewitched? And at Ephesus are still by their lying words misleading the children of men. Could the veil be lifted from before our eyes, we should see evil angels employing all their arts to deceive and to destroy. Wherever an influence is exerted to cause men to forget God, that's all it has to be, just to cause people to forget God. Amen. There, Satan is exercising his bewitching power, and when men yield to his influence, ere they are aware, the mind is bewildered and the soul polluted. The apostles' admonition to the Ephesian church should be heeded by the people of God today. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5.11. Yeah. So, I have shared this before in just speaking about it, but today I've got it on the screen. The early um, baptismal vows of the uh, earliest church, which we know was the church of Rome, the earliest baptismal vows, number one, was 
Do you reject Satan? I do. And all his works? I do. And all his empty promises? I do. And do you believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth? I do. And do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, also was born of the Virgin Mary and was crucified and died and was buried and rose from the dead and now seated at the right hand of the Father? I do. And the rest of it is here. But the point is, back at that other part, do you reject Satan? First, first question.